a lot for this in introduction, and uh, thanks Akash uh, and uh, also uh, other members, Lynn and uh, Sebastian, for this uh, very nice uh, SPICE seminar. And uh, yeah, today I will talk about uh, automagnetic textures and automagnetic dynamics, and I'm very happy that I had uh, so, uh, these two nice speakers before me who uh, get you used to ultramagnetic concepts. Yeah? Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I will <laughs> wrap up some of the main points in order to explain your motivation of this work. And as you have already uh, heard, that uh, um, this search for ultramagnets was somehow inspired by the idea to combine in one material uh, the uh, <coughs> Uh, the properties of ferromagnet to uh, split electronic bands and also the robustness and uh, fast uh, magnetic dynamic of antiferromagnets. Yeah? And to do this, uh, what was done, uh, so to get this classification which distinguishes ultramagnets from antiferromagnets, uh, Libor and Cairo and Thomas, they looked at the local environment yeah? as shown here. And uh, they studied the effect of this local environment on the electronic bands. And so the uh, main message was that once you spoil the local environment, yeah, so once you consider some uh, low symmetry environment of the magnetic atoms, you get uh, the uh, low symmetry electronic bands looking like the uh, waves, and uh, then you have new properties. You have this uh, spin splitting and so on. However, and, and then, of course, you can um, uh, have a lot of uh, the ferromagnetic-like effects, in, again, in electronic structure, which can be very useful for spintronic applications. Uh, however, uh, this uh, makes a problem for us phenomenologists who uh, try to explain uh, experimentalists what the high theory uh, predicts. Uh, we need to make a bridge between the two. And the problem is that uh, as a phenomenologist, we used uh, to work with uh, the um, magnetic sublattices as they were introduced by nail. Uh, so it's a kind of microscopic pattern. And we used to describe uh, the magnetic dynamics of antiferromagnets in terms of uh, Landau Lifshitz equations of the classical base. And even uh, with the block equations on quantum level, but still thinking about localized magnetic moments. But now, what should we do if everything is concentrated on the electronic structure? Should we go to the uh, spin uh, operator uh, presentation of the dynamic in terms of the electronic bands? Or uh, we can uh, somehow correct or uh, improve uh, the uh, macroscopic approach. Yeah? And uh, the motivation of this work was to find out uh, how we can uh, take into account ultramagnetic uh, features staying still uh, on the concepts of uh, magnetic sublattices and looking at the classical magnetic dynamics to be friendly to our experiment. And uh, of course uh, it's also <laughs> <laughs> a very important question uh, because many of the materials which were before classified as antiferromagnets now uh, seems to be ultramagnets like hematite. Yeah? And uh, for years we described it in terms of uh, these classical pictures. So what we should do now, reconsider it or not. So how should we proceed uh, with this phenomenology? So my uh, first supervisor was from Landau School. So the first thing, if you are in a difficult situation, you are looking for the order parameter. Yeah? So uh, then uh, uh, we tried to look for the order parameter of this um, ultramagnetic uh, transition. And instead of looking on uh, ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic materials or that phases, we started from the paramagnetic phase. Yeah? when you do not have magnetic bordering at all, and then you can get uh, ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic phases and introduce corresponding ferromagnetic and uh, staggered magnetization as a good parameter. So it's uh, well known. But in uh, this picture, we can do uh, another 
can imagine another transition. Once we are talking about local environment, we can imagine that these nice circles can be deformed in a different ways. And so this deformation can also follow like quasi-ferromagnetic or quasi-antiferromagnetic order. Yeah, you see, I can deform all the atoms in a or environment in a similar way, or I can uh, make a staggered deformation. And we can describe uh, this uh, deformed environment also, uh, like we, we can introduce a variable, uh, which here is shown as a tensor, it's like a tensor of deformation. And then from these deformed states, uh, we can also get a kind of ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic ordering if we go uh, take into account these exchange interactions, and uh, also a ferromagnetic and ultramagnetic phase. So what we are interested in, if we are going uh, through this uh, yellow light uh, way, we can get uh, from this pra phase or para phase through the kind of deformation to the ultramagnetic uh, phase. And then we have two order parameters. Yeah? We have one, uh, so to say, structural order parameter, U, uh, which describes uh, the ultramagnetic structure of the lattice. And then uh, we have a magnetic order parameter which was introduced by Leo. To give you a more basic understanding how we can build uh, the real model, we, co we consider a, a, a typical dead type uh, ultramagnet like plutonium dioxide. And uh, then we have two magnetic sublattices which are shown uh, with uh, red and uh, blue. And then uh, we have like environment shown with these small uh, dots. And then uh, we can introduce uh, this kind of the structure or the parameter here it's uh, illustrated as a rhombus. And what is important, we uh, in, um, introduce this kind of deformation. It's not a lattice deformation, it's a kind of for the parameter, but it's introduced for each of magnetic sublattices to uh, take into account these environment things. So then we can do all these Landau uh, or whatever symmetry analysis, quite boring, and uh, then you end up with a kind of uh, invariant term, so which you can consider as a contribution to the free energy, which uh, now has an uh, ultramagnetic feature. So what is important here is uh, this factor, uh, which uh, describes uh, this deformation of the local environment. And what is also interesting here in this expression that uh, it includes uh, only the scalar products of uh, magnetization and the nail vector. So it's exchange approximation. So it is invariant with uh, respect to any rotation of crystallographic lattice. And uh, what is also important here is that this term includes uh, derivative and it, it uh, vanishes in the gamma point. So it means in homogeneity. So we will assume that the structural order parameter is uh, zero and we will work with uh, this type of expression. And to give you the idea uh, what it means, I uh, write it in terms of magnetic sublattices. So uh, this term uh, is shows the uh, stiffness and intra-sublattice exchange. So you can see that the indices of sublattices are the same. And what is also interesting, it changes sign if you rotate 90 degree uh, the uh, direction of your axis, but if you simultaneously change the indices, you promote the atoms, you restore uh, the symmetry. Okay, it's a theory. What can, uh, I mean, it's like a very general expression, but what we can get from this. So as uh, this ultramagnetism appears uh, in, uh, in a homogeneous case, so we need to look at the textures. And the simplest texture, which you can imagine, is a magnet. Yeah? So let's see what we would have in uh, the magnet spectra with uh, this ultramagnetism. I start from antiferromagnetic magnets. And thank you, Harriet, you gave a very nice introduction into this subject. So, uh, but you talk about uh, ferromagnetic magnets. What do we have in antiferromagnetic case? It's known that antiferromagnetic magnets have very different structure depending on the K vector. And if you uh, go uh, closer to the uh, brillouin zone edge, then uh, the oscillation of uh, the uh, magnetic sublattices are not equivalent. So they are mainly localized on one on magnetic sublattices, like 
uh, orange or green. And uh, then, uh, but these all uh, subplatices are fully equivalent, and uh, this means that uh, the magnon spectra are fully uh, degenerate. Yeah? So here you show, uh, you see uh, the uh, dispersion, typical uh, dispersion. Yeah? Uh, both modes, which you, uh, both uh, magnon branches have the same uh, frequency, the whole uh, range of k vectors, excluding uh, this uh, vicinity of the gamma point where you can have a splitting between the uh, adisos. Yeah? Nice and good, uh, but what uh, would we anticipate in the case of alter magnets? Again, if we are uh, close to the gamma point, K0, then uh, the magnet is delocalized on both sublattices. Nothing interesting, but uh, the closer to the brilliant zone H, uh, the more uh, localization of the excitation. But now we have different stiffnesses uh, which couples uh, the spins uh, within one of the other subplates. So, intuitively, we should anticipate a splitting between magnets, yeah? simply because it's different stiffness. And uh, this uh, can be explained on a, a microscopic level, as it was uh, done by Igor Smekhail and others. So, for example, if you look at this continuum dioxide uh, crystal, uh, then you have different exchanges uh, within one sublattice. You have this nearest neighbor exchange between down spins, and you have also next to the nearest exchange between down spins uh, along the diagonal. And if you uh, look attentively at this figure, you see that uh, this exchange uh, next to the nearest exchange it uh, is mediated by oxygen atoms in a certain direction for one magnetic sublattice. But uh, in the, uh, for the other sublattices, this exchange depends on the uh, overlap of uh, the wave functions only. And this brings uh, this difference in splitting of the exchange integrals, and in a uh, microscopic model, it uh, results in a different uh, stiffnesses. So, what uh, do we have uh, at the end? Here, uh, we show the result of the uh, calculations, which were done in three using three different uh, approaches. So uh, the symbols, uh, orange and green, show the data uh, from the experiment. So it was, mm, sorry, uh, DFT calculations. Uh, so uh, the spectra were calculated using uh, the uh, exchange uh, parameters found by DFT uh, calculation, and uh, the calculations were done within the uh, microscopic model. Uh, the uh, color code, uh, blue and white shows the ca calculations based on the atomistic model, and uh, this red and uh, black line shows uh, the phenomenological uh, calculations. Yeah? And um, what is important here, so this and these directions are perpendicular to each other, so this is a dispersion in 1, 1, 0, and this is minus 1, 1, 0 direction. And what we see, which is uh, clear intuitively, is that uh, we have splitting of uh, two modes with different uh, spin polarization. Uh, they have different uh, velocities, uh, magnon velocities. Uh, but then, if you rotate the system 90 degree, then uh, the, uh, these modes sweep. Yeah? So, uh, <coughs> depending on their polarization. And what is also interesting, uh, this um, splitting exists only in certain directions. And uh, if you look at uh, the uh, dispersion in uh, the other crystallographic directions, both modes are degenerate. And this exactly coincides with the behavior of the, of the electronic bands in this material. So here you see the electronic bands, uh, electronic uh, band splitting, spin splitting, calculated in different directions, and only one a part of uh, this case space uh, shows a pronounced split, splitting, and uh, this is what we call the D type uh, of um, alter magnet because the splitting has D wave symmetry. And here you see the same calculations for uh, uh, the magnons, and it reproduces uh, the same uh, symmetry uh, in the case space for magnons. 
nice and good, but it was like uh, confirmation uh, of the fact that without uh, magnetic phenomenological theory, somehow uh, is able to grasp main uh, features of uh, the magnet spectrum. But what we can predict, for example, based on this model? So the next simplest texture is uh, a domain wall. And again, we know the, uh, what antiferromagnetic domain wall is. Uh, so uh, the antiferromagnetic domain wall can be uh, treated as two ferromagnetic domain walls, uh, which uh, like coherently ch uh, change in space. But uh, the main feature of this wall is uh, that these ferromagnets are exactly antiparallel at each point. Uh, so you see this exact alignment of two magnetic sublattices, and uh, then such a domain wall has no uh, non-zero magnetization, at least uh, in the most of the models. However, if we uh, look at the, ultra, at the ultra magnetic domain wall, we find out that again it, it consists of two ferromagnetic domain walls, but now each of sublattices has different stiffnesses, and this means that it has also different uh, domain wall widths. What does it mean? It gives rise to the counting, unavoidable counting of magnetic sublattices, as uh, you can see from this figure. Yeah. Of course, it's exaggerated, but if you calculate it uh, accurately, you, you can find out that such a domain wall should have non-zero distribution of uh, magnetization. And what is more interesting, uh, it has a magnetization component which is exactly parallel to the easy axis, to the direction of the real vector. Uh, so here you can see, uh, in this graph, you can see uh, the result of our calculations. And uh, for this, uh, the Z component, so the component of magnetization along uh, the real vector, uh, easy direction of the real vector, and uh, then uh, this distribution is anti-symmetric, and if you start to rotate uh, the direction of the domain wall, it again follows this uh, fourfold uh, symmetry or um, D-type symmetry, which we observed for the magnon spectrum. Uh, so again, uh, we have one-to-one -one mapping of the uh, ultramagnetic properties of electronic structure and magnon structure, uh, magnetic structure. And uh, then we also see that in some direction, uh, the material uh, will behave like a pure antiferromagnet. So we always have this sensitive angular dependence, which can be an evidence and confirmation of ultramagnetic properties. And uh, now, uh, what can we do uh, with this uh, magnetization? So magnetization is not zero, but uh, average is zero. It averages to zero, so you cannot control the domain wall with the external magnetic field, homogeneous magnetic field. But uh, this uh, domain wall has a kind of octopole magnetization. I like uh, this definition of um, Nicola Spalding. And this means that uh, this uh, distribution couples with uh, the gradients of the magnetic field. So what we did, we used typical values of the uh, mag magnetic field produced by the um, magnetic force microscopy. And then uh, we calculated uh, the energy uh, profile for the domain wall and also the force which would act on the tip uh, from uh, the domain wall. So uh, what we see, first we see that this tip can move the domain wall along the uh, line or along the stripe, and also it could be attracted to the domain wall, and the numbers are comparable with uh, that uh, people uh, see in the experiments. And uh, now, uh, what we can do with the domain wall? We can try to move it. And which uh, new phenomena can we observe uh, for the moving domain walls in outer magnets? So for antiferromagnetic domain wall, everything is known for a long time. It can move, and it can move very fast. And uh, in, in contrast to uh, ferromagnetic uh, domain walls, uh, the antiferromagnet has no Walker breakdown, uh, and, but it has a limiting velocity, which is very fast. However, 
if we go to the anti alta magnet, we see that uh, the moving domain uh, world has a deformed structure. And again, it comes from these different stiffnesses of the magnetic sublattices, because uh, then the typical velocity of one sublattice and the other sublattice is different, like the different magnet velocity. And this means that uh, they were moving, they cannot match each other, and then uh, they induce non-zero magnetization, additional cutting of magnetic loss. What does it mean? Uh, this effect is very similar to what we observe with a Walker breakdown in uh, ferromagnets, and as such, uh, the um, mag uh, magnetic domain wall became unstable earlier, so for um, uh, smaller velocities compared to the velocities of the antiferromagnetic domain wall. So, of course, you can see here this uh, limiting velocity uh, for the ultra magnetic and antiferromagnetic domain wall, the difference is not so large, but still there is this effect. And uh, now uh, I'm very close to the end of my talk, and I would like to discuss uh, one more point related with the ultra magnetism. Uh, so uh, I showed you uh, that we can get phenomenological uh, description of the um, ultra magnets. Uh, using uh, this symmetry analysis. And uh, then uh, this term, which I discussed here, uh, was intentionally of exchange nature. So I looked only on the term, which uh, has uh, these uh, scalar products of the uh, magnetization as an element. However, I can do further this kind of analysis, and then I found out immediately that the same symmetry operations which allow for ultramagnetic stiffness, they are also responsible for the DMI, as, which has spin orbit origin, as you can see, because this DMI term depends on the orientation of the magnetic vectors with respect to the crystal magnetic axis. So what does it mean? The first conclusion is that all the ultramagnets, collinear ultramagnets, uh, they allow uh, for uh, DMI. So now this weak ferromagnets, uh, the uh, materials which were be, uh, before considered as a weak ferromagnets, they fall into the class of alpha uh, magnets. Yeah? And um, the second conclusion is that, in principle, if we are dealing with the uh, textures in alpha magnets, we always have both effect, the effect coming from uh, non-zero DMI induced magnetization and the effect coming from the alpha magnetic stiffness. And these both effects can interfere for certain ge geometries of the textures, as shown here for this domain wall, uh, for this type of the geometry, uh, both um, ultramagnetic stiffness and DMI have exactly the same profile. And they can add up in one direction, they can cancel each other in the other direction. But they are very similar. However, if we have the domain wall which is oriented in other direction, as shown here, I mean, uh, the orientation of the nail vector, then uh, the behavior of the ultramagnetic stiffness induced uh, magnetization and DMI induced magnetization is very different. And this opens a way to disentangle these two effects. And also I would say that maybe we need to reconsider our data on uh, DMI values for uh, known weak ferromagnets because in principle they can have also this ultramagnetic contribution which we never uh, took into consideration. So with this I am at the end of my talk and I would like to acknowledge uh, all uh, co-authors who participated in this work and the Jairo uh, was on the first slide. So <laughs> 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 <laughs>